right. you can go ahead and start, sir. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. I'm Wade Scott. Um, my elder law practice is the Delaware Elder Law Center. And the way I'm going to approach and organize my talk today is just from the perspective of if I was meeting with a family, um, the questions that I would have and the issues that I um, would try to, to spot. As I begin to talk and you have a question, just please um, get my attention and ask the question. Uh, I want you to ask the questions as they come to you. That way uh, it can just be become more of a conversation. Um, my experience is we learn a lot just through the good questions that the audience has. Um, so when I, when I meet with the family, yeah, so there's some feedback or something from someone that's kind of uh, a distraction. I don't, I guess everyone should, should be on mute. I just muted the audience, sir. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. So for, as a, a general matter, when someone becomes an adult, at some point sooner rather than later, they should put their uh, or get an estate plan in place. Um, an estate plan addresses specific issues. Um, one of the issues is who's going to settle your estate. You want to you want to pick that person so you're in charge of who that actually is. And then um, there should be a design for the transfer of ownership of assets at your death to to the individuals that uh, you want to be your beneficiaries. But there's more, more than that that the estate plan addresses, and that is, should you become a disabled person in the sense that you're unable to make your own financial and health care decisions, you want to name specifically a person to take over for you and then a backup to that person so that they have legal authority to help you out. It's sometimes confusing, but... A person's status as a parent or a spouse or just as um, an adult in another person's life doesn't give them legal authority to make decisions if, if um, a family member becomes a disabled person. That authority is established through estate planning documents. It's part of the estate planning process. The documents that that address the issue of times of disability and un inability to make decisions consist of the durable power of attorney, that's the financial authority, the advanced health care directive, and a HIPAA release. That's authority um, for na the named people in the document to talk to medical personnel and to get medical records. It allows the doctor to transfer information freely. So as a general matter, all of us as adults need those documents. In the context of this particular presentation, if someone um, receives a brain injury, you know, that's a very particular reason to get an estate plan in place so that these documents that address the issue of disability and empower other people to help you out with your financial situation and your, your health care decisions, that they're in place just in case later on the injury causes uh, problems with uh, the patient's ability to make their own decisions. Um, if 
if someone reaches a point where they cannot make decisions and don't have the documents, there is a, an alternative source for the authority, but that source is the court. The process is called the guardianship process. I'm sure some of you all today uh, have some level of experience with the guardianship process, either directly or indirectly. Um, it's a, it's the court process is very expensive. Uh, it's demanding, and essentially, um, the guardian and the disabled person have invited the court into their life permanently. By that I mean, once someone's appointed the guardian, they'll serve in that role till the disabled person um, is no longer disabled or dies. Once a person's appointed, the court is very reluctant to um, let that person uh, out of that role. It's very difficult to get the court to uh, appoint someone else once you're appointed. It can be done, but it's it's a difficult process. One of the issues in the background where someone has um, received a brain injury is will they ever need the assistance of other people with activities of daily living um, from paid caregivers, you know, or assisted living or skilled nursing. Once a person reaches a point where they need the assistance of other people that they need to begin to pay for, it's very expensive, particularly if you move into a facility. In the power of attorney, it is critical that the document has language in it that will allow your agent to protect assets for financial qualification purposes for government benefits. If it's not specifically in the power of attorney that you can protect assets, when I say you, meaning the agent, then there is no authority for that. And that will require the agent to apply to the court to become guardian so that the court can grant that specific authority. So it's really important to not only get the power of attorney document in place, but that the document itself contains the language that's necessary to take care of someone uh, that has a, a disability that may lead to that person no longer being independent with activities of daily living. The point I'm trying to make right now is that every power of a document, excuse me, <laughs> every power of attorney document is not the same. Um, it's really important that the key language is, is in the document. Uh, it's, it's very risky to, to rely on downloaded documents from the internet. My experience is those documents have problems. In particular, there's no authority to protect assets for government benefit qualification purposes, for example. <clears throat> Where do you go to get these documents in place? It, it really should be uh, an estate planning attorney at a minimum. Um, if a person has some form of dis disability, like a, a head injury, it really should be, um, they should be working with an elder law attorney whose practice involves qualifying individuals for certain types of government benefits um, that require some financial qualifications. You know, I'm trying to drive home the point of don't try to get these documents on your own. Um, yeah, you really need to, to meet with an attorney that um, deals with government benefits just so that uh, 
the lawyer has the background and the training to consider all the issues and to address those issues. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Okay, so now then there's the issue of, or an issue that I see a lot is parents will talk with me and consult with me and be concerned about how do I get assets to my disabled child who is on government benefits or it's foreseeable that at some point because of um, some form of disability, they, they're going to need support of government benefits like long-term care Medicaid to pay for caregivers. How do I get assets to that person in a way that it won't ruin their ability or won't affect their ability to qualify for government benefits? A lot of times the family comes to me or the parents come to me and they'll make a statement along the lines of, well, I know I cannot provide in my will for my disabled son because it will disqualify uh, his qualification for benefits or make it so he cannot qualify. Um, so I'm thinking of, for example, not making him part of my will, but to make it so that his older brother will um, take part of the inheritance and take care of my disabled son. And that's generally can be a, a disaster. There's a lot better way of going about it. And that is under federal and state law, anyone can provide for a disabled beneficiary who's on government benefits or it's foreseeable that they will be applying for them at some point so that they can transfer assets to that person in a, in a way that they're protected. And that's that's done through the estate planning process and it involves adding a feature into the will or a trust, depending on the circumstances, so that this disabled person will receive their inheritance into a, a supplemental needs trust or special needs trust is sometimes what it's referred to. And under the law, if the, the language of the trust is, is set up properly, the inheritance contained in, in that supplemental needs trust protects the assets, which means the disabled beneficiary gets to keep those assets and have access to them and still get to keep their government benefit. The reason it's important is it makes it so that this disabled person has money to pay for unexpected expenses um, that aren't covered by some type of insurance or covered by the government benefit that they're on. Um, it's very effective planning. It's, it's something that exists. Unfortunately, it's not something that a lot of families are even aware of unless they attend seminars like this. Excuse me for one sec. Attorney Scott, we have a couple of questions that's in the chat. So would you like for me to go ahead and read them or would you like to wait at the end? No, no, go ahead and read them. Thanks. Okay, so the first question is from um, a caller, um, D. Rivard. She said, what about the forms that are provided from the DHSS website? And for the um, participants on the call, she put a link there. Um, are those forms valid? So the forms that she has are, um, it's a directive form. Are those forms able to be used in lieu of an attorney? Yeah, so I just wanna be sure I'm on the same page with the person asking the question. Is the, the form that's being referenced the uh, advanced healthcare directive? 
Um, the it person, sounds like it is. It, yes. Do, she's okay. Will you do you mind coming off of mute and asking your question to attorney Scott directly, please? Of course not. And yes, the one the link to the one form is the medical directive. And the link to the other form is found under Title 10, 12, Decedents and Fiduciary Responsibilities, and that's a durable power of attorney. Okay, so in my world, we call those forms statutory forms uh, for the health care directive and the durable power of attorney. Um those forms are valid as long as they comply with the statutory requirements, but because of uh, the source of the forms that you've mentioned, um, I, I'm reasonably confident that those are the current statutory forms that comply with um, the statutory requirements. Thank you. Yes, they're valid documents. The issue there is when um, a family <clears throat> relies on those documents, the issue is not that they might not be valid, which means effective. Um, it's does the family understand the context of those documents and how they operate. Um, Probably not. And that's where the <laughs> lawyer comes in. Right. Now, it's really important for the family to understand the role of being an agent under the terms of these documents. So the agent is the person that you name uh, to make, for instance, financial decisions for you or healthcare decisions for you. That person who accepts that role and, and their authority is actually triggered, um, that person has legal duties to the disabled person that, that named them to serve as their agent. And it's really important to understand what those legal duties are. Because if, you, if the agent doesn't know about the duties and uh, the scope of those duties and how to carry the duties out properly, that's what causes a lot of problems. So that's where the lawyer comes in is to educate the agent about the duties, we call them duties of care, that they owe to this disabled person. Um, so a family can get form documents, and if the family follows the directions in the statute carefully, the documents will be valid under Delaware law. That means um, they're enforceable documents. It's just that there's more to it than than just that. Um, one of the things is for the the statutory form for power of attorney. That's kind of a check the box form, and so on the document you you kind of have a, a list of authority with a box uh, to the left of it that the person we call the principal needs to physically put a check mark by to make it so that that indicates that the agent is to have this type of authority like um, banking authority, real estate authority, power to make a gift. Um, so the principal needs to check that box. The problem is, I'm sorry. The Everything is too complicated. Yeah, it, it is kind of complicated. The problem with the statutory reform is it lists the type of authority that is available, 
but it doesn't tell the reader what the scope of the authority is. It's so the, the form says banking, banking powers. Well, what's that mean? If you use a statutory form, you have to go to the statute itself, find the language about banking power and read it and, and read it so the agent knows what they can do and what they cannot do. Um, and to me, that's a real shortcoming. And that's where going to a lawyer comes in because the lawyer will provide that education. In, in, in my practice, I don't use the statutory form. Uh, I like to, to set out or provide a description of each type of authority, what the boundaries are. Um, so it, it's much more clear uh, to the agent and the principal what's involved in how to carry out the job correctly. The other thing is the statutory reform does provide for authority to protect assets for government benefit purposes, but you have to understand that, that, that that's one of the authorities that's being listed, and you need to have the background to understand that, for example, if you have a, a brain injury, you would want to check that box, authority to protect assets. A lot of times, the family that are just trying to, to go it alone and use a statutory form without any background or uh, direction, that's one of the things that's almost invariably missed. You know, it's not checked. Uh, the family gets to me at the point where the injured person can no longer make decisions. That's why the agent becomes activated, um, but the authority wasn't checked. So now we have to go to court. And so that's, in my view, in my experience, you save a lot of time and effort by just starting with the lawyer to begin with. And I, I'm sorry, that was a long-winded explanation about statutory forms, but I think it's important to give you the background on that. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so before the question where I, where I had left off is addressing kind of the issue that that loved ones have often it's parents. Can I make a disabled uh, child a beneficiary get assets to them when I die in a way so that they don't lose their government benefits? The answer is yes. That, that issue is addressed in a person's estate plan, either in the will or a trust. And that just depends on the circumstances. Um, and uh, the tool we use to protect assets so that a disabled person can inherit them is called a special or supplemental needs trust. So my point is just to educate you that um, this planning opportunity exists. It It's much better than just saying, I'm not going to make my disabled loved one a beneficiary of my estate. I'll just give everything to, uh, usually it's an older sibling, and have that person take care of the financial situation of, of the disabled sibling. And it, that really doesn't work very well in practice. There's also the issue of, that I hear that people ask me, and that is, is it possible to take action now before I need government benefits so that my, usually it's the house, so that my house is protected for government benefit qualification purposes and the main government benefit here would be long-term care Medicaid so that um, if I become disabled, have to pay for expensive care, can I qualify for Medicaid, but my house 
uh, will not be considered an asset. Um, and I don't, I can't be forced to sell it and Medicaid can't put a lien against it. We call this um, pre-disability planning for Medicaid purposes. The answer is yes, it's entirely possible to set things up so that the house over time will become a protected asset for Medicaid qualification purposes, which means once the protection uh, is established, the house is protected forever. It, it's um, always in the background and long-term care Medicaid will pay for a disabled person's care. This is still, this is Medicaid pre-planning and it's, it's part of the estate planning process, but it's what we call advanced planning. Um, and it's putting in place as part of your overall estate plan um, protection for the house. And we do that. The tool is a separate irrevocable trust, irrevocable trust. We move ownership of the house into the name of this trust. Um, and it takes five years after the, the house is renamed into the name of the trust for the protection to come about. But after five years, the protection's 100% and the house is protected. Um, it's just one of those things that the protection doesn't come about immediately upon uh, transferring ownership to the trust, it takes five years after the trust becomes the owner for the protection to, to come about. Does anyone have questions just about that piece, Medicaid pre-planning to protect the house? Um, Attorney Scott, thank you for all of that information. Um, it, it's, I think that we have, um, just looking at the audience that we have, this seems like a very complicated topic um, for the audience. And is there any way that um, some of the participants could be able to sit down? Because of course, there's a lot of information to share and we can't receive all of it within a short period of time. Sure. But, so they can sit down and ask those questions and just walk through it with them so it won't seem so complicated for them because um, kind of putting it in layman's terms, you know, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Oh, it is. Now, my suggestion would be um, for anyone that wants to understand this, um, these issues in better detail and how they're addressed through the estate planning process is to first start with our website. And there is a lot of very specific information about these issues I've talked about today on our website. I have a, a blog series and a video series that kind of work together um, that talk about these issues and, and how they're addressed. Um, that will, I think, be very helpful because I try to break it down into, into digestible pieces of information. And I've tried to write about it and then present it in um, lay, a lay person's terms so that it, it's more digestible. I'm also willing to, to meet with people that have reached the point where um, the need to protect assets and the, the need to be sure that they've name the right people to have authority to make financial and healthcare decisions. You know, there, the need has moved from the theoretical 
to the actual. Um, so that we have a context uh, for for discussion, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, that's part of what I do for a living. I meet with families where the need is there. They really need to understand what their options are, um, so that they have the right level of planning in place, and if protecting assets is something that's really important to them, that they understand what their options are and and have uh, a plan in place for for addressing those issues. Yeah, happy to do that. Okay. And is there um, something like a checklist? Because at the end of, the, of this presentation, I'm going to send out to all of the participants a... Um, a, a copy of the recording, as well as, um, it, can you share those links, maybe to your blog, or you can have your assistant to share them with us, so I can share it with all of the um, participants, and is there a checklist that maybe you could go over, or that you could speak to, so that they could know these are the things that they need to have in place? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I'll have um, Carly send you the the specific link to the blog video section of our website uh, so that a person can click on that, and that's where they will arrive. Um, and then with respect to a, a checklist, this is – kind of the way to think about this. The first thing that needs to be put in place is what I call the foundational estate plan. And the, the foundational plan consists of a set of documents. And those documents are a will or trust, those two documents are where we name who's gonna settle our estate, excuse me, and puts in place a design for the transfer of assets at death. <clears throat> then there's the durable power of attorney, advanced directive, advanced healthcare directive, and HIPAA release. Those are the documents that empower someone to make financial and healthcare decisions for you if you can't make, make them on your own. Together, that's the foundational plan. From this foundation, once it's in place, that allows us to address other issues when they... Uh, arise and those issues involve um, needing to protect assets um, so that a person doesn't run out of money because they need to pay caregivers that's very expensive um, and that's really kind of the checklist approach is get the foundation in place first and then uh, from there, the the agent uh, or anyone that's authorized to make decisions for another person who's disabled can then take steps to protect assets for government benefit purposes. So that that that's my suggestion. Start with the foundational state plan. Get that in place because that'll allow the family to address other issues as they arise later where you know a person's disability begins to affect them more and more and more and becomes very expensive does that does that help yeah yes that's very helpful thank you sure well thank you all for the just the opportunity to share some information with you um I'll get that link to you and um, please feel free to, to reach out to us. 
Um, we're here to help. Okay, did anyone else have any other questions before we excuse attorney Wade Scott? As long as we're gonna get his contact information in case anyone is interested in trying to set up an appointment with him and then the links to the blog and video posts, that would be awesome. It's been very interesting, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Okay, thank you so much, um, Attorney Scott. Thank you everyone for joining. I wanna also once again thank Highmark um, for sponsoring the Educate Delaware series. We will be having the next series. Um, it's better to train with a buddy that will be presented by Beth McDonald on October 17th at 2.30. Um, if you have any questions or need any information, please reach out to me at admin at biad.org. And I will be sending out the links to Attorney Scott's blog, as well as his contact information and a copy of the recording. So thank you, everyone, for joining, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.